I'm going to back up a little bit because an underlying problem with the politics in a police department, at least in a civil service department, is back, I think in the late 80s, the Jersey City Police Department and the North Police Department, both of which, uh, which are subject to civil service rules and regulations, were taking out of the testing process for chief of police. Uh, in other words, if you, as long as you were a sergeant, uh, supervisor for I believe it was five years or longer you could be appointed chief of police by the mayor that has caused nothing but problems it's caused problems with public safety directors or police directors overstepping their authority um, it kind of puts pressure on a police chief to submit to political pressure from a mayor's office on things that he shouldn't submit to like if you had an appointment even if you had an appointment like a six-year appointment that would be staggered with mayoral administrations, at least you could say, no, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> so when people point to my um, short tenure as being, you know, indicative of um, malfeasance or misconduct or ineptness, that's the furthest thing from the truth. My short tenure was because I said no, okay, I wouldn't let uh, the mayor's office, the administration, the public safety director, corrupt me. Right? I wouldn't let them interfere with my office. I met, first met Steve, he was the president of the Paulus Hook Block Association, I think, or he had some relationship with that association. <clears throat> and when he was running for councilman, I said, you know what, let me back him for councilman. I liked the guy, you know, I thought he was a... Um, I thought he was a stand-up guy. I thought he had uh, true values to a point. And, this might surprise you, I needed a vehicle to become the chief of police. Because that's the way things happen in Jersey City. And it has nothing to do with Bob Cowan. I like it when people say, ah, this guy was political. Of course you're going to be political. If you want to be the chief of police, they force you to be political. Okay? The, um, the legislature... The people in Trenton, they're the ones who created this, okay? And I just beat everybody at it, at least, you know, for the nine and a half months. But in terms of politics, if I, I had no problem testing for the job, okay? So I was uh, number seven out of 500 men when I, ran for, uh, when I tested for sergeant. When I tested for lieutenant, I was number four the first time. And then there was political influence exerted there to prevent me from being promoted at least initially, where I had to actually test again, um, even though I got promoted off of that list, but I had to study, and the, the amount of work that goes into it's phenomenal. And, and then I come out number one on a lieutenant's test, highest score in the state. Captain's test, I come out number three, and a deputy chief's test, I come out number one. So if you made a chief's test, <clears throat> a civil service test, I'd be a civil service chief, and I wouldn't have had to put up with this nonsense. You know, that, that happened to me. You'd be able to run the police department with limited interference. And I'm not saying that you don't want to do what you're told by the mayor, you, in, you know, in reason. Like, any time I had to move commanders or I felt the need to move commanders, I always discussed it with uh, the public safety director or the mayor. Because, they, you know, they have buy-in. It's a big move if you're going to move a, a precinct commander. And I understood that. Um, but it's not that, that I have to abide by what they say. But I always, you know, wanted a conference with them. And so I, I wasn't like I was being unreasonable. I would say that that's absolute nonsense. And <clears throat> most people know that. So when, when a new administration takes over, the mayor names all their drivers, you know, who they want to drive them, you know, uh, the police officer, security driver, each and every driver that was driving for Healy, I reached out to them and I said, where do you want to go? And I will put, in, you know, within reason, I will put you where you want to go, okay? Um, Patty McCarthy, who worked for nine years, or whatever it was for the Healy administration in the chief's office, he remained uh, as a staff officer in my, you know, in my office, and I, I trusted him, okay, because he's a professional. Um, I could point to numbers of people who I kept. I don't 
like have political enemies, the people I don't like are incompetence. People who don't want to do their job. Uh, people who think that the Jersey City Police Department was created for their convenience. You know, that they have to work 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. You know, it's not like that. But there's a lot of police officers, uh, not all, uh, of course not all, there's a lot of police officers that feel that way, that it should go around their barbecue schedule, their sports schedule. Uh, things like that. And I never asked anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do or haven't done. Okay, in the middle of the night, um, when I was the chief, I would be out on the street. Um, I would respond to calls, usually shootings. I kind of made it a, a goal to respond to every shooting. Not to interfere with the cops and the bosses on the scene. And I think most of them will tell you I didn't. Hey, how you doing? Is everything going all right? I wasn't telling micromanaging what they're doing because you know why? The Jersey City Police Department, probably left to its own devices, is the best police department in the state of New Jersey, okay, in my opinion, okay? It's when you get the political interference uh, and decisions made just on the politics is, is when things go the wrong way. say that somewhat of a fair point it wasn't like I targeted I say this I, like, like for instance <clears throat> the motorcycle squad when I, from as early as 2004 when I became like uh, uh, like on a citywide basis like as a lieutenant um, I had problems with the motorcycle squad in terms of it was like a fraternity it was they would the police dispatches would get on the radio and they'd say is there a motorcycle unit available in the North District? That's not how you dispatch a car. The reason they had to ask is because, a couple of reasons. They weren't put into the computer system or onto the lineup that the uh, Central Communications had. Or they were intimidated by personnel in a motorcycle squad because they always got to come back with a, a smart answer. And, and this is 80% of them. This isn't like a small number, okay? Uh, at one point, I had supervisors, and I'm not going to name names here uh, because it's not productive, but a supervisor says instead of making east, south, north, and west uh, motorcycle units, we're going to have just east, uh, uh, we're going to have motorcycle unit one, two, three, four, because the supervisor was interfering with their proper deployment, okay, because now you don't have any, everybody, if you have a job up in the, let's say the North District, everybody's going to say they're out in the South District. Who's going to say they're not? Okay? So, to that point, what you're saying, I would say, yes, I wanted everybody to work, but it wasn't done in a vindictive manner. It wasn't, one of the first things I did when I had the opportunity when I became the Chief of Patrol was I took the motorcycle squad, and I believe at the time they had 13 or 14 uh, members of the unit, and I, like, nine of them were working days, and four or five were working, you know, the evening tour, I flip-flopped the manpower, by seniority, also, because I wanted a larger number on the evening tour, okay, the reason being, you know, I had plans for them with, uh, you know, um, street crime interdiction, I wanted them, not just to be traffic officers, I wanted them to be out there helping with, um, crime and addiction. That's the type of thing I did with the motorcycle squad. And I took the, the SIU, uh, Special Investigations Unit, and I would put them, if I had a problem, I didn't have to keep them on any super secret type of investigations, because, you know what, the Jersey City Police Department has to take care of street level business before we start taking care of super secret stuff. Okay? A lot of guys weren't happy. Some of them were. You know, some of them uh, appreciated being able to do, do a job, but some guys were there, uh, and it was ingrained in them that they're too important to do regular police work. That is objectionable to me. Okay, I want to start off by saying that the way you initially framed your question, you said some people claim it was a vindictive thing that I went after them. So, forget about them having alcohol, pornography, um pornographic tapes inside. They're just worried about I'm being vindictive. So I want you to keep that. That's a violation of the uh, several policies in Jersey City to have pornography in a locker room. I'll tell you what was discovered was violative of uh, department policies, uh, 
state policies, um, federal policies, if they have any applicable to that, okay? Uh, alcohol has no business in a locker room, you know, uh, of offices that ride around on two wheels. Uh, forget about four wheels. So anyway, the place is what we call, in, and I'm going to do police lingo, it was a shithole, okay? So we had a locker room, a big locker room near these toilets that would back up and you would smell the sewerage coming into our locker room where you're getting changed. Okay, so Captain Connors at the time was uh, he was transferred into city command, <clears throat> and he asked the uh, commander of the motorcycle unit at the time. He says, oh, "Listen, you got this uh, locker room sitting here doing nothing uh, across the hallway. It's got a shower. It's got a nice bathroom. It doesn't stink. Uh, do you have a problem with us using it?" And first of all. I said, well, you know, why? It's not his building. It's it's our building. You know, we're captains. But in any event, he chose to take you know the, of asking, which is probably the, maybe the right way to do it. But it's inconsequential. He asked. He was uh, <clears throat> put in there. So we put a television in there, put a chair in there to sit down when you're getting changed. Some people like to say it's an overstuffed chair. Some people, whatever. Um, and everything was going well. I'd be able to go out for a run, work out, go in, take a shower, you know, get ready to go out in the street. Um, so it was me and Joe that were in there. And the other captains, they didn't, you know, didn't bother to even move, you know, from where they were at. So Joe got transferred. He became the East District Commander. Within, I don't know, three weeks or so, I, I walked in. The chair is gone. I think the television was gone. I'm not sure. but And it was like, what the hell's going on here? And then I seen the names of two female officers on a locker. I said, somebody move in? So I called up interested parties involved. And, and they said that they, they had a um, detail going on for teach people how to install car seats. And I think that was another instance that might have been investigated by the prosecutor's office. I, I don't know how that worked out. But in any event, the two female officers, who i never seen working there, uh, now had like uh, scrap paper would say, Officer Smith, Officer Valerie um, Jones. <laughs> so it was made up. So he says, what's going on? Oh, you, you can't be in there. We're put, we need these, uh, this locker facility for female officers. It was a dead-on run at me. Okay? So, since they needed that space, I thought this would be a good time that I would go and inspect the facility, the entire building, for additional space. For a locker. I mean, why should, I, you know, why should a captain be moved out of, of a place he's been? My, my clothes are there. I have a nice place to shower, take a run. Uh, at the time, I probably have 27 years on a job. And you're giving it to two female officers who were never there because they work in different commands. You know, it was a, essentially what it was. It was a bogus run at me, you know, just to mess with me. Um, in any event, while I was, while I was uh, go, inspected the facility, I found one officer actually lived there. He had mail, you know, and, you know, so ultimately that was taken care of. He was sent away from there. And that was on a lower level uh, where we found this stuff. I again, no, none of us knew that there was somebody. It was like it was in an out of the way place, and so you know, I think I offered up. You know, there's a spot there that you could put the offices, um, and then I went into the locker room, the locker facility of the motorcycle squad, and that's what I found. And I would say, uh, if you're gonna pull the t tail of the tiger. You better be ready to get bit. Two days prior, the city had reissued, as it does every year, its sexual harassment policy. And everybody needs to abide by it. And captains are supposed to go in and inspect all facilities. So how could I be wrong doing that? Under the Healy administration, the interesting fact, and uh, actually I had a call and from a very high level. And I don't want to name him because I want to break a trust uh, in the Healy administration. Um, 
very high level, is that the chief of police at the time, Tom Comey, he wanted to skip me. Okay, I was number one on the list, but he wanted to skip me. There's only been one person skipped in the Jersey City Police Department, and that was a really good guy. He was a captain, and when they had inspectors, and he was uh, should have been promoted to inspector. His name was John Curran. Okay, real good guy. Should have never happened to him. And I guess they wanted to make me the second one because of the the politics in the police department. And and, and Mayor Healy wouldn't let them. He says, "Don't promote anybody or promote you know, four, but you're not going to skip the guy." You know, which is uh, that's a stand up thing to do. I 100 percent thought that this guy was like a fiscal conservative, that he really wanted to do the right things in Jersey City. And I'm not that naive. I, I, I feel very naive because I really, really thought he had it in his heart to change Jersey City, you know, and to change the police department and the police culture. Because, um, you know, we had, we had uh, talks. I submitted paperwork to him on some ideas I had, which he liked. Uh, you know, I have them all in writing which aren't confidential because he was a candidate in my J.C. Bubba account. Um, but, you know, the probably the first indication I got that he was, even, and I actually took him to meetings, you know, in places where it seemed to me he had uh, statewide ambitions, but this was at the end. This was towards the end after he had won, you know, and it was, there, was a, there was a period of time where there was some runoffs going on, okay, and... I seen that he was already, he, he just got up one rung of the ladder and he was already on his way up to the next. And prior to being made, made chief of police at a meeting that we had, he talked, he, he essentially admitted that. He says, we got bigger things here. And he says, you know, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a lot more here than, uh, you know, just what's going on now. So we all have to play our cards right. And me, I wasn't made. It took him three months to make me, and I just said, uh-huh. Because <laughs> I'm not going to argue until I say I do. Uh, July of 2013. Did you know that there was going to be a public safety director going, if Philip was elected, that he, there was going to be one? Yes. Did you think it was going to be someone that he was going to empower to the point that, you know, he's essentially running the show as far as the police department? I thought he was. Uh, I thought he was going to try and have somebody uh, come in and come in and run aspects of the police department. You know, just more of an overseer, more consistent with what a director of police would do. I didn't have any idea that he was going to bring someone in to like cover for him which is essentially what I've watched the director try to do while I was the chief of police. And then, you know, just seeing from the outside right now, it's just a constant what the director Shea likes to call a shit show. Okay? Nobody, I don't, listen, I don't buy that. I don't buy that the, uh, overall it was a morale problem. I buy that the cops like being led. They mm -hmm. like their chief of police being out on the street with them. Okay? I think the people that didn't like being led were the people that didn't like working. Okay? And the people uh, and then you had some of these some of these lawsuits. None of them. None of them uh, I was found guilty of anything. Do you feel that, you know, Shea was someone that was working for the interest of the SOA? Or was he working for the interest of the department and... The SOA. S uh, <clears throat> and but he wouldn't do it outwardly. Everything was behind the scenes and behind my back. Um, you know, there was so, some of the conduct that I've seen since I left uh, is abhorrent, you know, that people have gotten away with. It's unfortunate. I like Phil. Phil is a, it's a, he's a really nice guy, you know. Um, you sit down and you talk to him. He's very friendly. He's got a great personality. But I don't think anybody should be working off duty jobs that they're not going to. Um, and again, I'm not, my opinion doesn't count. And, 
U.S. Attorney's Office did what the U.S. Attorney's Office did, and the judge did what the judge did, and the judge felt appropriate uh, as punishment. What I wanted to do, I wanted to see, again, uh, let's go backwards to 2013, October, November, even September, uh, where the ordinance was being discussed, placing the entire off-duty program under Director Shea, okay, essentially taking the chief out of it. So, there were meetings, of course, because it's a, it's a, it was a transition, um, and there was pick masters, like we all know the stories, you had the story, they're all in your, in your paper, they were pick masters. A lot of them guys were hard-working cops, you know, regardless of what they did. You know, I, I, on the, the good stuff they did, I have a lot of respect for. A lot of the guys were, were good cops on the street. You know, they just ended Would up... Would you put uh, Barry else in that conversation? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Juan was a hard worker. But uh, again, you know, it's twisted, you know, how... What they did is what they did. You know, I don't... I don't but you, I, I like to also look at the good that the officers did. So, in any event, I was at meetings with... Uh, with Director Shea and some of these pick guys, and he's bang, banging on the table. We got to get out, get the cops out of these off-duty jobs. They can't. The mayor doesn't want any police officers involved in running off-duty jobs. He wants everybody out in the street. Now, that was just a political position by Mayor Fall. Okay, that was a political, because you couldn't run the police off-duty job system without police officers. They, I, I believe they brought one guy in, and he thought it was a Monday through Friday 9 to 5 job. It just, it just doesn't work that way, because jobs come in 24-7, uh, whether a pipe bursts on Tunnelly Avenue, whether uh, a building collapses and you need off-duty coverage on uh, Wegman Parkway. <clears throat> so what I said was, we, you can't do this. You need to keep the cops here, but what you need is a command structure, Director, because you're putting probably upwards or even more than 135 police officers and supervisors a day out into the street. I mean, I was around in 9-11. I was on this side of the Hudson. Jim Shea was on the other side of the Hudson. Uh, our initial responding officers, 100 plus, were coming from off-duty jobs, myself included. So <clears throat> I says, what you need is more police officers. We need commanders. We need a commander, be it a captain or a deputy chief. I would go with a captain, a lieutenant, may, you know, as like the executive officer, almost like a precinct-sized command structure, and two sergeants, one for the south and the west, one for the north and the east. And then these other officers work under them, okay? This way you have a check, and you have accountability, and you have a check against corruption. The mayor doesn't want any police officers involved in this. Again, it's a political, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, it's a political statement, because mm. he wants to be the mayor, that we have all the cops on the street, and this and that. And that was, I think that's what Barrios is talking about, because he was probably at a couple of those meetings, you know, when everybody was discussing the um, off-duty job system. Because you can't run a system that's got $15 million a year in it, um, With 135 cops a day, you can't run that system without the potential for extreme amounts of corruption. Okay, but, you know, Jim Shaden, he failed to see that. He just wanted to please Mayor Fulop. He didn't want to bring back Mayor Fulop answers that the mayor didn't want to hear. Um, and what gets me is the different scandals that have come out afterward is... Everybody seems to forget that Jim Shea is in charge of the off-duty jobs and administering them. I mean, I watched one of your tapes. I watched uh, Tom Mahoney, who's a gentleman. I mean, I like Tom, uh, but he only talked to Jim Shea one time. That's what, he's, that's what his testimony was. One time about taking over this position that controls a $15 million budget. And Jim Shea doesn't give him the memorandum, memorandum of understanding to read on probably what's the largest closure of a public highway in the state of New Jersey for the longest period of time that connects, like, New Jersey to New York. So, I mean, that's malfeasance. 
He should have been fired. In a real police department with a real leader, like, you know, a real mayor, he would have been fired. The mayor would have said, what? But, now I'm going to give you a little background on his hiring, okay? Because Muhammad Akil called me after he uh, had been appointed or whatever he was, you know, because he was working out of the Journal Square building. And he says, what do you think of Tom Mahoney? He says, I think he's a nice guy. Now, I'm not going to say anything more because, you know, it's not my business now. It's, he's the director's employee, okay? I was never consulted. He says, yeah, yeah, I met him at a party, uh, you know, a couple weeks back, and he seems like a nice guy. He just retired from the corrections department. So, I mean, are you kidding me? You meet the guy at a party and you put him in charge of a $15 million program? Come on. I mean... I, I, okay. Was he working on the campaign, though? Was my I've never campaign? seen him. But I'll tell you this. Whatever Steve Phillip ever said about Healy, and, you, like, I couldn't, I wouldn't, if you would have went backwards, like you said, like, before he ran for Maine, you would have said Phillip would have went along with an appointment like that on an over $15 million program. I would say, take your temperature. That, that would never happen. But, you know, that's what you got. And again, and it's not a knock on Tom Mahoney. You know, because it's a, it's, a, it's a tough, tough job, and it's certainly a tough job for somebody walking in, you know, from corrections without an accounting degree and, you know, some type of management degree. I think that it was a political prosecution. You had Fulop say he took the pride, I believe it was in one of your articles, and for some reason that skipped my mind, or I didn't even read it. Fulop took credit for it two years back. He took credit for corroborating with the uh, the prosecutor in order to um, bring these this hundred count indictment forward. There's lawsuits against Jersey City, Director Shea, Chief Zaki, Mayor Fulop, by Ascalis and Chesler. Okay, I think the other two just got. Pulled into it. I think he, Mayetti also had a lawsuit. Okay, so let's prosecute them and let's use a Jersey City police sergeant to be the lead investigator. So the Jersey City police sergeant, who works directly for the chief of police, you know, with obviously a little bit of a buffer, you know, the uh, internal affairs commander, but directly is investigating somebody who's suing his boss. I mean, how fair does that sound? Um, and what's extremely interesting with the whole prosecution is that they never put not only the Jersey City Police investigator on a stand, they didn't put their own investigator on a stand. Now, I have a lot of respect for the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office and the people I met and worked with as the Chief of Police. and. Over the years, uh, on patrol, you know, uh, at scenes of homicides and other things that we commingle that. A lot of respect. So this is by no means a knock on a Hudson County prosecutor's office as a whole. But I, I imagine all of them, all of them, were embarrassed by the footage that they seen. Okay, because if you didn't, if you didn't film that video, film that, it could have all been hidden. You know, we would have had. We would have had a two-paragraph story from uh, Mike Conte that misreported everything as much as you can misreport and put in two paragraphs out so you can get out early, I guess, you know, from the afternoon session. I, I'm being real, you know. Your, your coverage of that trial really, you know, uh, almost like an innocence project because of the pressure on... Somebody like Kelly Chesler, who had health issues that I'm not going to discuss, who the city went in, and they, she had another job, okay, and they went in and they interfered with that job. So now she had, she had no job, okay, uh, and they they tried to ruin them. Okay, you said it took two and a half years, okay. Joe Ascalis gets suspended, okay. For, uh, I'm I'm sorry, not suspended. He gets, they take his pension away. This is all about starving people. You know, I never really seen the inside of something like that as, you know, as, as I did from reading a lot of your articles and uh, things like that. But when you see the inside of something like that and what they're doing to these people, of, I mean, Mike O'Neill, I can almost imagine 
he must have had his family. I'm not saying nothing bad about his family, but people saying, Mike, just do it. There's just whatever they're asking you to do, just so they can eat, okay? And their children have health care, okay? And then, during this whole thing, I don't know if there's a lot of people would talk about it. They'd say, 104 count indictment, they're going down on something. I said, my opinion has always been this. So I know Joe Ascalese, I know Kelly Chesler, and guess what? 104 counts is bullshit, okay? If the house of cards, it's a house of cards. You take two or three cards out, and the whole thing's going to collapse, and that's what happened. That was probably the most, that was probably the most embarrassing trial that I've ever seen, and I'm surprised it lasted as long as it did. I'm enjoying it. I have a really good business. Um, the past year, it's been pretty much taken off. Um, I'm specializing in marital type stuff, the cohabitation, alimony, reduction, or elimination, and child custody. I find it very interesting. I mean, I'll do an infidelity. It's not my favorite because uh, the emotions are too intense, things like that. But I, I really enjoy working with attorneys and clients uh, regarding cohabitation cases and um, child custody. Um, I recently took on, uh, there's going to be a news release shortly, I recently took on a new North Jersey uh, regional operation manager that I'm happy to have with me because I worked with him for years, Captain Joe Ascalese, retired Captain Joe Ascalese. Um, we actually worked a job together up north, uh, you know, with uh, that I had had when I needed assistance he did a bang-up job with me uh, and I'm looking forward to renewing that relationship